I'm Helen Armitage. And I'm Chris Webb. And you're listening to The Next Normal, the podcast that explores the impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had and continues to have on different individuals, organisations and sectors, spying the world of business, education and careers. On The New Normal, we heard from a range of individuals about how they were adapting to a challenging climate. And we're now taking this one step further as we look to the future and quiz another slate of fantastic guests about how they're planning for the unknown, what different sectors are doing to adapt, and whether any green shoots of optimism are starting to appear in the wake of the pandemic and subsequent lockdown. Thank you for joining us as we explore what the next normal might look like for all of us on a local, national and global scale. A very good morning and welcome to The Next Normal. Uh, I'm joined as always by my co-host Helen Armitage. Uh, Helen, how are you doing today? Yeah, very good today, thank you. It's the middle of Storm Francis at the moment, so it's a bit windy and uh, went wild out there, to be honest. But but no, all good, all good. How about you? Yeah, yeah, not too bad, not too bad. Not actually at work today, although, of course, as you mentioned with the weather, not really enjoying um, that, the, the time off per se, having to sit inside all day. Um, but our guest today perhaps joins us from slightly sunnier climes, possibly. We'll, uh, we'll find out. Um, as our episode today focuses on the game sector, the video game sector, and esports in particular. And we're joined by uh, Sheffield Hallam University uh, alumni, Scott Parkin, who's a competition operations manager for Call of Duty at Activision Blizzard. Um, Scott, very good morning to you. Uh, how are you doing today? Good morning. I'm good. Thank you for having me. And yes, the weather is considerably better. It is currently <laughs> 30, 30 degrees at 10 a.m. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm not going to say depressing because it's certainly not depressing for you, but. Uh... <laughs> But I cannot go outside and enjoy it because we are still pretty much fully locked down. So yeah. it looks nice outside the window. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. You made us feel a little bit better. Yeah. <laughs> Love it. Um, so before we get stuck in, some really, really good content for us to go through today uh, on what is a very, very exciting sector that is starting to get a bit more traction in the mainstream media. Um, as usual, we start with our gloom busters, our good news stories for the week. Um, so Helen, uh, any good news stories you'd like to share with us to kick things off? Yeah, I think for me, it has to be the announcement of Tesco's 16,000 jobs that they are recruiting, more mainly to reward the temporary uh, members of staff that they recruited at the start of lockdown, that they're going to be hopefully making them permanent and then recruiting some more people. I think it's just really nice to see some positive (laughs) recruitment stories in this current climate where we've just been littered over the past few weeks with this amount of job losses here, that amount of job, lo- job losses there. It's just really great to see that um, a company is, is taking on members of staff during the current climate. Yeah, so they're definitely pos- positive for me. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Something to combat the rain today, which is, uh, which is good to hear. Um, I think my good news story for this week um, is slightly tied in with our, with our episode today. And um, I don't know if either of you have, have watched the Netflix documentary High Score, which is um, it's all about kind of origins of sort of the video game industry. Um, but some really top nostalgia in there. So it covers all sorts of things from kind of the 90s Sega versus Nintendo battle, uh, you know, looking at the arcades in sort of the 60s, 70s, 80s. And there's just some fantastic stuff in there, fantastic individual stories about kind of how the game sectors kind of had that cultural influence on different elements of society, not just within kind of the video game sector, but also in arts, music, and various other things as well. So, so that was great. I've really enjoyed um, kind of watching that on my week off. But um, so a little bit, not necessarily a good news story, but something I would definitely recommend for people to have a look at. Um, and Scott, finally from you, any, any good news stories you'd like to share with us at all? Yeah, for me, it's just due to the stage of the season, we've just finished our playoffs and... While we had some issues to start with, we closed it out strong and we unofficially, because I've not seen the full tally yet, um, but we set a new viewership record for this year, um, which was good. And then this week we've got our Champs Finals weekend, which is the end of our season. So hopefully by the end of this week, I'll have some very good news and we will have successfully completed our first CDL season. Fantastic. Really good to hear. I mean, if anyone's listening at home, you want to find out a little bit more about this, we will be putting in the episode notes um, an article recently from the BBC, uh, which focuses on uh, some of the stuff that's going on at the moment in terms of the champs that Scott's talking about. So really, really worth having a look at um, when we put those in the notes. Um, Helen, over to you. Right. Okay. So if we just kick things off then, Scott, if you can just tell us a little bit about how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted your, your work and your job role. So for my actual job role, it's been a fairly easy transition to go everything online. Certainly my day-to-day work, while it's a little bit harder, just 
in general, it's been fairly smooth to transfer online. The only problem is running a competitive season online has essentially cranked the difficulty up to max and the, world, the events have just got so much harder. Um, there's so many more factors compared to when you're offline that you can't control. That has made it probably the hardest year to run a competition I've ever had and in about 10 years, so that says quite a bit. <laughs> So, I mean, Scott, you, you, for those of our listeners who may be less familiar with, with eSports in general and, and kind of the competitions that you're talking about, can you tell us a little bit more about um, the role that you do within Activision Blizzard and I guess really, I suppose, how you kind of got into eSports in the first place? Yeah, so I'm going to hope that the audience here has some slight knowledge of gaming, but when I usually describe this to people who have no knowledge, this is how I do it. So essentially, my role is like working for the FA for football. It's, we set the league structure, we determine the schedule, we issue any rulings, we decide what the rules should be. Essentially, we define what the competitive league looks like. That's the nutshell. Um, then when you come to actually operating, it's making sure that all these plans and this structure that you've made operates. So it gets different to the FA here, where when you come to an actual football game at the weekend, you leave the actual running of the event to the teams. Um, we do that as well. Um, so it's a little bit more all encompassing because the industry is still relatively small in terms of personnel who actually work. So yeah, that's, that's the crux of it. And um, it gets quite busy. Um, it, it, it varies from company to company as well though. It does tend to be a very hands-on role where you touch a lot of everything. Um, this year, for example, I'm doing far more IT networking than I ever planned to do. Thankfully, at university, I did web information systems. So I have quite a good knowledge of tech and networks, but I had to do a lot more this year on that. Whereas in a previous role, I did a lot of play behavior. What should a professional esports player do and how should they act as a role model? So it varies from company to company, but those are the essentials. Fantastic. And you mentioned, obviously, that, you know, the main sort of game you're involved with is Call of Duty, which um, for those sort of listeners at home who are not familiar is a, is a first person shooter. In terms of, I suppose, how that might differ to kind of other esports, so sort of things like FIFA or kind of um, traditional sporting type video games. Is there a difference between people in your position related to those, those different types of games? Or is it a fairly similar role, but perhaps um, just with, with different contexts, I guess? Yeah, no, it's... Um... You can, you can apply the skills to any video game, essentially. Um, there are a lot of different nuances that you have to pick up. Off the top example, basically, one is um, with Call of Duty and FPS titans in general, latency is key. Now, in something like League of Legends, it is important as well, but the difference of five ping is a lot more noticeable in an FPS game than it is in a MOBA. But when you get to the top levels of play, also those margins become a lot narrower because a top League of Legends player will notice a ping difference the same as a top Call of Duty player, Counter-Strike player. So pros are the same across games, more or less. So yeah, once you are working on a game, your skills can transfer to another game pretty easily, which is one good thing about the industry. And yeah, absolutely. And you're obviously talking here about kind of professionals. And I suppose what would be quite interesting within your role um, to sort of know perhaps where that came from. And I know you sort of mentioned this briefly before the show, you know, not necessarily knowing too much about esports when you were in university yourself. So, so how did that kind of journey begin and, and what sort of got you into esports? And I suppose where you are today? Really? An accident. Well, yeah, an accident. I fell into it. I can safely say this after a decade of being out of university, but I didn't spend my university time as well as I should have on my actual degree. I spent most of it playing Call of Duty 4, Modern Warfare. Uh, that was as a player, just competing. And I got shit from my university friends because I once skipped one of the ice hockey matches for Sheffield Bears, the university team, to play a Call of Duty match. And my teammates could not understand that at all. As you can imagine, ice hockey is quite a bravado, uh, a lot of alpha male sport kind of thing. Um, and alpha women actually at the university. So they didn't understand that I was gonna play a video game instead of uh, play an ice hockey match. But then I stopped playing Call of Duty because I found it too stressful playing competitive matches till like midnight when I had university and I saw a free to play game called League of Legends come out. And I was like, there's no way a MOBA can be as stressful as an FPS game. And then I ended up joining SK Gaming as a journalist. 
and moved on to become their League of Legends manager and didn't suck at that and ran a competition at Insomnia 33 for the multiplayer LAN event, which was the first League of Legends competition in the UK because multiplayer were prioritizing Heroes of New Earth at the time, so they weren't producing the tournament. I ran that tournament just through the multiplayer forums, um, getting people to sign up, no prize money or anything like that. I think Riot in the end donated some RP gift cards. But yeah, and then job came up at Riot as an esports coordinator. I applied and I got it. Didn't have any formal experience other than volunteering for SK. And I did all that after I came home from working in Sheffield City Centre as a web developer. So yeah, I just kind of like volunteered in my own time after work and didn't suck. I credit my career to not sucking more than the guy who was applying next to me. So that's, very, that's great. very fortunate. We might come back to that for the top tips later. Not might be a quote that. of the day. <laughs> yeah. Number one tip. Honestly, I, I feel very fortunate. Like I didn't particularly have experience in anything that I'm doing now. I just did it as like a kind of passion project because I enjoyed the games and took them a little bit too serious compared to my degree. But my mum has forgiven me now. So. <laughs> <laughs> that's good to hear that's good to hear and I mean one one I think final thing on this point Scott before we move on to maybe some of our other talking points I mean mm. you're obviously in the US now I, I, how did you sort of end up then what, what sort of led you over there in terms of that journey from where you were sort of at the beginning getting into esports and how you sort of ended to where you are now well I guess one thing that this can lead into well is if you're going to work in esports you cannot be tied down to one place um so my first role was I just applied in Dublin um, because that's where the esports coordinator role was for Riot. Um, moved to Dublin for about a year and a half. Then Riot moved esports to Cologne in Germany. Moved to Cologne, spent a season there working with ESL, and then Riot decided to take everything in house and move it to Berlin. So I moved to Berlin. Then about four years there probably, and then I left Riot. Um, because my wife, who also works at Riot, um, she wanted to. She's from LA, and she moved back to LA because she wanted to move back home. And we considered the options: was do we move to England or do we move to LA? Obviously, LA won for the weather, but also the industry. Um, there's just a lot more jobs um, around LA for esports specifically. Video games, you can work in the UK. But it's only been the last few years where I've seen jobs in the UK where I'm like, oh, I could actually, I could apply for that now. Unfortunately for me, I've kind of gone to the point where I am, I've got more experience than a lot of the roles that are starting to come up for league operations specifically in the UK. Because the ones I've seen so far tend to be from esports organizations. I know Excel have posted a few positions recently. Fnatic historically have applied, employed a lot of people in the UK and there's Rogue now. So a lot of those are looking for entry level performance managers, coaches, team specific things. But now my experience is mostly on the other side of the industry, like publisher and developer. And sadly, there's not as many of those in the UK who do esports. There's plenty for general gaming though, which is good. That's great. Thanks, Scott. We'll probably come back to that a little bit later in terms of kind of signposting people who are interested in perhaps getting into esports. But um, but that's fantastic. Really, really nice overview of um, sort of how you've got into where you are for now. Um, and we'll move on to our, our next discussion point. Yeah, really interesting. Um, okay, so esports popularity um, has already been on the rise as a spectator sport. Um, we've seen events in stadiums around the UK um, and often drawing quite large crowds. Given the current issues with social distancing due to COVID-19, do you feel that sports fans might turn to esports as an alternative, um, growing the sector even further? I don't know whether it's as an alternative. I, well, I mean, I guess it is, but there's a void of competitive content, shall we say. Like with all the professional leagues, they went on a hiatus and we were able to continue. People wanted to see teams or individuals beating others. Um, and yes, uh, we definitely had a good year for the industry in terms of viewership and people playing video games in general. But I, the reason why I won't say alternative is because I don't think a football fan is just going to suddenly switch and start watching FIFA. As a massive Sheffield United fan myself and somebody who plays FIFA, I do watch the occasional FIFA esports, but it's not because I can't watch Sheffield United at the moment. I don't think fans necessarily translate to the video game version. 
but I do definitely think people are tuning in to find some form of new content and they will find an eSport that entertains them. So, um, yeah. I suppose it'll be interesting to see if your kind of ratings continue at the same level after the pandemic has, has kind of surpassed and we've got back to as, as was kind of the, you know, the old kind of world that we were living in, if your ratings will still continue, I think that will be, that'll be quite interesting to see. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, it'll be interesting to see if it has a lasting impact, like if people yeah. who came to tune in, stay tuned in, did they enjoy yeah. it? I'm sure there'll be plenty of people within various companies analyzing that to find out mm. if it happened. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, I suppose take it a little bit back to something you kind of mentioned earlier in terms, of, I suppose, that idea that, you know, previously it's maybe not been something that's so well known in esports, but, but gradually we've kind of seen it creep into the public consciousness a little bit more in the mainstream media and, and through kind of various things such as, you know, League of Legends being kind of put in sort of open air events in stadiums or kind of closed events, but getting much bigger crowds than perhaps people would have imagined 10, 15 years ago. And I guess part of that also comes back to what you mentioned around education about, you know, not maybe not being that widely talked about in the past in terms of a, a route, uh, you know, a potential kind of career pathway for people. Um, and certainly in South Yorkshire, I know we talk, we're talking about this a little bit before the show, um, we've kind of recently seen Barnsley College launching their kind of BTEC esports course and kind of making quite a bit of noise about that. That's um, with the British Esports Association in kind of conjunction with them um, in terms of writing the standards for those qualifications. Could you potentially see that popularity of esports courses increasing in the UK as we start to get a bit more traction in terms of people knowing more about the industry? I think it's inevitable. People want to go into the industry. People don't know about it. They need to learn about it. I think it's inevitable. I have very mixed opinions on the courses available at the moment. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if this is the time where we want to dive into those. But yeah, like for at the moment, I'm, I can't 100% say that somebody has to go and study esports to be in esports. Um, I'm very 50-50 on that matter at the moment, especially at university. Now at college, my opinion is actually a lot softer. I think I remember my, myself at college, I had no clue what I wanted to do in the world. And it wasn't until I really started to specialize for university where I consider like my real higher education came through. Um, so for college, if you are interested in esports and there are these general topic courses, I don't see that as a bad thing. But at the moment for university, I think I lean down on specialize onto an aspect of the industry but one of the problems there is knowing what aspects of the industry are there but for me at the moment like if you want to get into esports and you enjoy putting on live events go to university study hospitality management event management those courses the video games industry has an abundance of product and project project managers those kind of courses at university would be invaluable. Maybe you're interested in the TV aspect of it because that's huge now. I would, don't think you can really get that beginner's level introduction into the hardcore TV industry unless you do it at university and you go on to a course that teaches you about how to do a live broadcast. And then if you want to do competition operations, good luck because there's no course for that yet. It's, it's one of those. I still think at university at the moment, you're better off trying to figure out what it is you want to do in esports. Maybe after you've taken that college course to learn about esports and then focus on that. So I think at the moment, that's probably going to put you into a better position at getting an entry level job at one of these companies. Thank you, Scott. That's really good to hear. And I think, you know, kind of leans back probably some of the advice that we would sort of give students really about kind of trying to work out what it is that motivates you, you know, what particular types of roles or kind of pathways, as opposed to just the sector and kind of diving in with no sort of prior knowledge of it, which is which is really good to hear. I think we can address a little bit more about kind of top tips um, a little bit later on, but I, I, it's really good to hear about those different routes, because I think, again, comes back to some of perhaps the common misconceptions, which I think, Helen, we're going to touch yeah. on now as well. Perfect leading. Absolutely perfect leading. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so my next question is about the number of, of common misconceptions around the esports sector. So a couple of examples we've got. So unless you're a hardcore gamer, there may be very few kind of career pathways available. The gender balance within the sector is, is quite poor and, and not that inclusive of female gamers. Can you set the record straight on some of these misconceptions, kind of following on from what you've, you've just said there? Yeah, so being a hardcore gamer, no, you don't have to be a hardcore gamer. Flat out, you don't have to be. Should you have an interest in video games? It would help. But that can be you are the world's best Animal Crossing player. It does not have to be that you jump on World of Warcraft every night and 
spam dungeons for six hours. You do not have to be a hardcore gamer. It's helpful to be able to relate to gamers, of course, and you will enjoy your life more if you enjoy the video game that you work for, but you definitely don't have to be a hardcore gamer. Mm. As opposed to females in the industry, yes, it's a male-dominated industry. It's having a lot of problems with how women are treated in the industry. This year, last year, it's come around like for the last few years. It's definitely a problem. I don't think, in terms of how many women work in video games, I actually think it's far higher than people realize. Like, it's far higher than when I was a web developer. It's far higher than when I had like temporary jobs during uh, university or other companies. And it's far higher than I saw my mum, dad and sister at their jobs. So it's actually quite good for the number of women working in the industry. It's just, unfortunately, things have come to light that it's not been the best industry for women to work in recently. But I'm happy to say that everywhere I have worked, including Riot, which got thrown in the bus recently, there was no problems within the esports teams that I worked on. And like I mentioned, my wife works in esports and she's been fortunate and she's not noticed any, like, any of the horror stories. Um, there's times when she's looked back and been like, okay, that's probably not cool. But at the same time, nothing like the horror stories that have come out. So while there's definitely a problem in the industry, I don't think that should put off women working in the industry. Quite the opposite. It's we need more women in the industry to speak up. We need more voices. Do you know of any kind of um, platforms or any of your current employers or previous employers? How, how have they kind of supported to create that gender balance um, within the sector? Um, I can't really speak for Riot anymore um, regarding that. Um, my time has passed since that came up and so I've not seen there. For Activision Blizzard, we make a conscious effort for diversity regardless when it comes to hiring. But when it comes to actual policies being implemented and stuff, unfortunately, I joined Activision Blizzard in November. By January, we were already considering working from home. So I don't have much visibility into what is being going on this year in terms of that. Everything that I've seen is via email and there are definitely initiatives going on for diversity and general leveling up the company, but I'm just not as close to it this year. That's that's absolutely fair enough, Scott. I mean, I think one other thing, I suppose, on that front, we've talked a little bit about kind of misconceptions, I guess. And I suppose, you know, as you've sort of mentioned, you know, maybe a lot of stories that might appear in the press, you might hear maybe only the most sensationalised ones about sectors where they're perhaps not as visible. I mean, do you get a sense that maybe that's changing at the moment in terms of, you know, do you feel like perhaps there's starting to become more visibility of the sector or do you still feel like maybe the representation is perhaps kind of based more on stereotypes than, than actually what's going on within the work that you do? It's changing for the better. I definitely, I mean, even comp- over the years, it's been getting better and better. Obviously, it didn't get better fast enough, but it is improving. You can already see there's bad actors being removed which helps. I don't want to comment on any of their stories whatsoever because I am not close to any of them. But obviously, like, bad actors being removed, hopefully better people coming into the place. Um, And then just the industry being more aware. I think that's the important thing. Even myself, when the horror stories were coming out, I had to ask myself, am I guilty? Like, have I been a part of this problem? Um, Thankfully, I was able to look at my conscience and think, no, I think I like to think that I have been a good role model in this but um the fact that i had to question myself and think back like am i part of the problem if i'm doing it and i come away with a clean conscience then i hope some other people have come away from it and consider changing their ways yeah so i think awareness has definitely helped um i hope that everybody has taken a long hard look at themselves and looked at how they can help move the industry forward Fantastic. And I mean, I think we're seeing a lot of that at the moment with race equity in the UK and globally, but certainly within our own employer and a lot of employers across the UK, you know, really taking, as you said, a bit more of an introspective look at, you know, how have we addressed race equity? What more can we do? So it's good to hear, you know, on a similar level in terms of diversity and inclusion, that, that is happening. And within these I, four- I, will, I will just want to say, though, it is still a problem. As much as I feel like I've given a positive there because things are improving and they definitely are. Is still a problem. Like I'm not going to take away from that that the industry needs to do better. Absolutely, and I mean, you talk a little bit about obviously the future of the sector, and you know, in terms of what it might look like moving forward. Obviously, the name of our podcast is the next normal. We're always quite keen to kind of not quite get people to predict the future, but perhaps kind of have a stab at, at sort of saying what might some of the big developments be within esports, or maybe where can you see things going perhaps over the next few years, um, COVID or not. 
I mean, it's difficult. Esports in general is, I mean, people have tried to predict it for years and it just does the opposite. It's very, I don't know, it's got a mind of its own. Um, so trying to predict the future, I'm not going to do. But in terms of uh, like COVID, I mean, I know for a fact that even when we started planning this season, we were like, 2021, it's okay. It will be offline again. Now we're considering 2021. What does that look like? We, the full plan for, I think, everybody in this industry is still to go offline in 2021. But now it's just the kind of contingency plan. And it's like, but what if? Do we go online? Can we do online? Obviously, this year, we've not, we've not delivered perfectly. Certainly not. We've had so many issues. The community has gladly let us know about those. And it's not been good enough. That being said, we had our hands tied quite significantly this year. Um, but in 2021, we now have the learnings of 2020. So it's like, if we have to do this online, what do we do? Um, so hopefully we would be in a better place. So I think it's changed the industry in that regard. I think you could potentially see a lot more people not going offline, just doing online events, especially developing esports, because it's cheaper to do an online event. It's harder, but it's cheaper. So that's one thing. Um, but one thing that I, and this has only developed in the last two weeks, um, but one thing I think we could start to see a big shift towards is pre-recorded content. Live is great, but also kind of live is still great, but it solves some of your issues. So even to avoid some of the DDoS attacks we had last weekend, we had to delay our show by a few hours or we changed it every day to make the timing different. So we went live around an hour after actually the matches were played. To the community, if they don't know, that is live and that's fantastic and it gives you a safer environment to produce a show. That being said, if the community discovers that it's not live, they get spoilers, you diminish the quality of the product and it's a challenge. But definitely pre-recorded um, VODs in general, VOD content is being consumed at a massive rate, especially this year. I've not got the data to back up if this year is an anomaly because that's not my role, but um, I've heard enough chatter to know that like YouTube VODs are actually performing fantastic compared to live as well. So it's one of those trying to find a balance. I think you might find companies looking into pre-recorded content and then just being fake live because it also allows you to develop a better product. You can edit and you can do all these fun things. So yeah, I think we might see more companies pushing pre-recorded content, which in general, we, I know we need to do more. As an eSport, we need to have content that's not just on weekends, keep people engaged throughout the week. So I think you'll see more of a push there. In terms of how it affects the industry as a whole, I'm not getting involved. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. A lot of predictions for us there already. And some really interesting parallels, actually, um, with the work that we do, a lot of companies are doing, in fact, um, certainly around what you're talking about, pre-recorded content. It's, it's becoming, a, I think, a real hot topic across many industries. So it's really, really interesting here. And of course, this podcast is, in fact, spoiler alert, pre-recorded. So it uh, fits very nicely. This is our um, new section of the podcast called Top of the Pods. We're asking all our guests to provide their recommended podcasts. Uh, so these are favourite podcasts that they've been listening to for quite a while or some new favourites that they've just stumbled across. So Scott, if you can give us uh, one, two or three of your, your favourite podcasts that you're listening to at the moment. Yep. Yeah, so podcasts weren't actually something that I used to listen to, but then I moved to LA and I started having to commute for an hour each way in traffic. So podcasts were recent thing for me uh, but the only ones I listen to are the Blades pod about Sheffield United because it's very difficult getting Sheffield United news in Los Angeles as you can imagine. We have a supporters club now which has six members so we're starting and then the other one is something called Puck Soup which is a NHL podcast about ice hockey. Um, I like to stay in touch with my sports when I'm driving. So just to kind of closely to wrap things up then Scott have you got any top tips for any um, young students, college, university level graduates that are wanting to progress into the esports sector? I, like I mentioned before, is really having an idea of what aspects you want to do. Um, as we just mentioned with like VOD content and stuff, there's more chance of video editors coming in. Maybe that's your, we're considering doing media and you also enjoy playing video games in your spare time. There's a crossover there. Um, maybe that industry is the one for you. And even outside of esports in general, I mean, look at streamers these days. Dr. Disrespect now has a full suite of content um, editors. 
a lot of them previously worked at Riot Games. Um, they came from editing videos for the LCS and content like that and moved towards um, streamers. So look at the core skills of what interests you. I would think of esports is your interest, but think about what you were planning to do in your career already and see if you can tie those in because there's probably something within esports that you can do. But then this is my kind of, it is a cliche, but it's, it's like it works for me to get into this industry. And it's something that I recommend to others trying to get into the industry is be doing it already. So while I didn't have experience, like I, said, I mentioned, I ran that tournament for League of Legends in the UK. So that gave me run, running tournament experience and I'll try and do one, another one. And then I went to Riot and they wanted somebody who could run tournaments with the ESL to serve their European players. I mentioned like I volunteered for SK Gaming as a journalist. The only, I never studied as a journalist. The only reason I could do that is because I was an English native speaker, which put me ahead of a lot of the people who didn't speak English as a first language. And then because again, I did okay at that role, I moved in to be their team manager and I organized things well. And I was just doing that in my bedroom in Sheffield from home. And it went on and like I say, the only reason I got the role is because I was doing some of these things already. So don't be afraid to have your own like passion projects on the side. Um, and that even goes for uh, if you want to get into video game development, because I know a lot of people who obviously work on general video games outside esports. And if you go to an interview and you can show even the most basic non-functional games, show that you are trying to do game creation, you know, show that you're trying to do it. You're learning it in your own time. It doesn't have to be good. It can be terrible, but show that that is something you're doing to develop yourself and companies love that. So yeah, you, you can start right now in your bedroom. Getting contacts is exceptionally hard, but just do what you can on your own, apply for volunteer positions. I know people have a problem with volunteer positions because it's hard to do something for free, but they do provide invaluable experience, um, but also know your worth. Don't do volunteer roles for infinite amount of time. Um, there's a point where you should start getting a little kickback, whether it be free goodies, merchandise to start with or whatever, just keep striving and then try and get into the industry. If there's any events in the UK, I know the multiplayer lands will probably be back next year. Just go, get involved, talk to the people at these fairs. They are the same people who work in esports. I know down in London, there's things like the Fanatic Bunker. You can go visit that anytime you want. There's esports bars around the country. Go, there's yeah. people like, if I'm traveling to London or Manchester for an event, there's a good chance I'm gonna look up the Meltdown Bar at the end of the event to try and have a drink. Go to these places, you know, wash them while you're there. There'll be industry people there and that's something you can do on your own. So yeah, just, just get yourself involved is yeah. the big thing and um, be flexible. Like I say, you have to move, especially in esports. Yeah. Um, I'd love to do it in from Sheffield right now, but it's not, it's not there right now. Um, <laughs> uh, well, I, I, it's amazing. I miss home. I do miss yeah, home. Yeah. I, feel like... I thought that was a really good tip, what you said earlier. And it, it's, it's so key in, in so many sectors, but I think your sector more so than, than others, really, that you, you do have to have that sense of flexibility. You know, you've got to be able to go where, where the jobs are, because it's, you know, it's, it's not the same as, as teaching or nursing. You know, there are certain areas of the world where there are more opportunities. So, yeah, I think that, that's a key takeaway, definitely. And I think in terms of mentioning about starting right now as well, I think that's something that, you know, we, we always try and reflect back to sort of students and graduates is, you, you know, you can talk and talk about this stuff, but actually exactly what you've said, you know, sometimes you kind of have to make a start in some shape or form. And I think some really good tips there, which we'll, we'll put on the episode notes in terms of kind of perhaps where to go. I mean, I suppose just as kind of a final comment on this, are there any sort of useful sources of information online that you could signpost any of our listeners to if they're interested in finding out more? Are there particular kind of forums or sites that, that collate a lot of this information? Not really, okay. um, <laughs> which sucks. But no, I'm trying to think hey, where, <laughs> I'm trying to think where I get my say, industry news from. Twitter is huge. Across games, follow key actors across games. You pick up knowledge, um, know what's going on. I know he's a controversial figure, but somebody like Slasher, he's got his finger on the pulse of every video game. You can see who responds, like find out who they are. And that's where most of my news comes from. Um, but it also varies on game. Like with League of Legends, maybe not for the industry, but for my job, first thing I'd do is check in on Reddit. 
because that's when I know if I've got a bug to fix, if a player to ban, if there's a scheduling change, like the community on Reddit will pick it up first. In Call of Duty, it's Twitter. Twitter's going to let me know first if I'm going to have a good or a bad day. So it's just, it, it's hard. That's one of the aspects, I guess, for the esports industry where while I guess we can't call it new anymore, it's still developing. So those kind of sources aren't great. The articles you find on the BBC News, while it's good to have them, uh, they're few and far between and they're hit or miss in quality. So yeah, just find out who players are in, in esports and follow them. I, I think that's really, really good advice. And I, I know that the British Esports Association are trying to be a lot more active on Twitter. I've seen a lot more stuff from them recently. And, uh, you know, and hopefully that kind of trend continues. So, it's, you know, it's good to hear, even though, you know, perhaps there isn't that kind of one source of information that there are in other sectors. I think, it, you know, it's good to know that, and as you say, social media, as we, we often mention on this podcast, a really, really key source of information. So, Scott, we have to say thank you so much for joining us today. Um, it's been absolutely great having you on. And um, for anyone who's listening at home, all of the information we've been talking about will be in the episode notes. So do check those out uh, if you're interested in anything that Scott said. Um, but once again, thanks very much for listening and thanks for joining us, Scott, and have a great day. Thank you. If you're interested in anything that's been discussed on the podcast or would like to be involved as a guest or have a topic to share, please get in touch with Helen or I via LinkedIn. Full details can be found in the episode notes on the Simplecast site.